Hi, I'm Aldo Kane. Thanks very much for coming to see Lessons from the Edge and taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm just about to abseil into one of the world's most active volcanoes uh, near Gongo in the Congo. And uh, this is just part of the day job. Over the next hour, I'm going to be talking to you about rowing across the Atlantic, setting new world records and loads of other adventures from all over the world. Thanks very much for coming and I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm Aldo Kane. And uh, like Dunk said when he introduced me there, uh, my background is I was in the Marines for, for quite a few years and then left. I now work in television and film doing mainly safety stuff like abseiling into volcanoes or diving with sharks. So I, I'm, I'm super lucky the way that I've managed to get myself involved in, in this type of work. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time out. I hope it's not boring. Uh, I don't really do much in the way of public speaking, mainly because I'm out the country a lot. So it will be very rough and very unpolished. And that's why Ross is also here to take some of the pressure off. Um, I think that's it as far as that goes. Uh, so there's lads up the back and a few other ex-Marines in here. It's, it's very much our background and how we end up sort of functioning and, um, and being able to do the jobs that we do. Um, but it's all based on the commando spirit, which is something that I joined at 16 and it's something that I pretty much use on a daily basis when I'm, when I'm working. Courage, determination, unselfishness, and cheerfulness and adversity. And that's, that's pretty much um, going through all of these slides will be, you know, that's, that's always in the back of my mind, in the back of what I'm doing work-wise. And it's, it's, you know, the same with Ross and the same with all the lads at the back. And these are the, the skills or the, the interpersonal skills that, that we take for granted, but very much um, that's pretty much what's helped me to get to where I am and do what I do. Uh, the rest of, the, the, rest of the, the sort of talk tonight is going to be briefly on... Uh, a little bit more of an introduction. Then it's going to be the row. Uh, myself and Ross and three other guys rode across the Atlantic this year, um, a couple of months ago, actually. And, uh, and then the rest of it's going to be called Lessons from the Edge. And it's really stuff that I've picked up over, over the last few years, doing some good and some not so good jobs, uh, which are you know, lessons that I've learned. So I'm just imparting that onto you, what I found interesting or not interesting, and some nice pictures. Uh, so I, I was in the Marines for 10 years. I was a, a sniper, um, British, well, the Royal Marines Sniper Course is one of the hardest courses in the world to pass. Um, and it's also uh, a lot of self-induced pressure. But basically joining the Marines as if that isn't then hard enough to then go and do another qualification after that in the Marines, uh, which is specifically field craft based, is, is, um, is one of the, the sort of higher profile jobs, if that makes sense as far as field craft goes. So I was uh, a sniper in the Marines for 10 years, as Ross was. Ross and I were both sniper pairs, sniper partner um, for a while. Uh, in the Marines, it's not just, it's not just a way of, it's not just a, a job, it's a way of life. It's everything from when you get up in the morning to when you go to bed. It's the way you conduct yourself. With the commando spirit, which is what I mentioned earlier on, um, it, it runs for the rest of your life. I've been outside quite a few years from the Marines now, but it still runs your life pretty much every day. And to that end, I guess it is really, it is a way of life, even long after you've left the Marines, and it allows you to then go in to do the jobs. Again, like I say, that, that I do now. Um, and it's, I guess the, the job that I've got now is more of a way of life than, a, than an actual job. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Ross Johnson. Uh, he's going to briefly introduce the, the challenge that we did this year, what we wanted to set out and achieve, and then we'll bounce through a couple of slides. If you're getting bored, just put your hand up and you can skip them. Uh, and then we'll, uh, and we'll run through the, run through the, the row. Cheers, Alan. Um, yeah, guys, uh, I'm Ross. Obviously, I was, as Aldo said, I was uh, Aldo's sniper partner, so I know Aldo from many, many years back, and we stayed friends ever since, since I left the Corps. Um, another friend of mine originally approached me um, to row across the Atlantic, and we were originally going to do it as a, as a pair. Um, and then we realised that, uh, obviously, if you're sleeping, for half of it and rowing for the other half, you're pretty much doing it on your own. Spending sort of two or three months with your own thoughts is probably not very good for people like us. So, <laughs> so we decided to uh, do it as a, as a four-man team. Um, I've got Aldo involved, um, obviously great guy with sort of admin and um, powerhouse and I can spend long periods of time without wanting to kill him, which was 
obviously quite beneficial. Um, and then we've got another friend of ours involved, Foxy, um, another Marine, um, and that made us up into a five-man team. Um, originally, we were going to row as part of the Talisker race, um, which goes across from um, La Gomera, just off the coast of uh, Antigua, um, or just off the coast of uh, Tenerife, sorry, across to Antigua. Um, it's about a 3,000-mile race because we're a five-man team. Um, that um, excluded us from that. So rather than uh, just taking that and basically thinking, right, we can't do this anymore, um, we decided, right, we're actually, if we're going to do this, then let's really do it. So we decided to do our own race. Um, There's a lot more admin. There's a lot more risk. There was no safety boats. There was no anything involved with us. Um, and so we decided to go from mainland Europe to mainland South America, which is basically adding another 1,000 miles on top of what is already a 3,000-mile race. Um, obviously, a lot more planning. We did completely unsupported, um, no safety boat or anything like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, we decided to crack on with that. We went down to... Uh, this is uh, Lagos in, in yeah, went Portugal, down to which, is, which is where we're starting. So this is us doing some training, uh, in true Royal Marine fashion, I think I'd spent in total about an hour in the boat before we set off and rode across the Atlantic. Um, I, I was away work with, with workload, so I didn't get out on any of the, the training. Um, we, did, uh, we did one training row. We rode across the North Sea, which took us two days. Um, which I wasn't involved with. Aldo was off doing something else. <laughs> the only training one I did do is we rode out to a, um, to a boy uh, with a load of beer and uh, <laughs> moored up for the night and got drunk and then rowed back rode in the back. morning. So I spent a total of about an hour in the boat before we, we headed out. But this is the team, this is the five of us, Foxy at the back, Matt, Ollie and Ross and then myself at the front. And that's a, an ocean-going rowboat. Uh, very cramped, compact, horrible space to be in, especially for, to be in it for, for two months, uh, which is what we were sort of aiming on or planning on. Uh, <laughs> This, this picture pretty much sums up. It's pretty much the conditions we lived in for, for two months solid. Yeah. Just what, what happened is we got on the boat and we started rowing and it was all fun. And then it got dark on the first night. <laughs> and then the waves got big. And then and we decided nasty. that this was going to be an absolute epic. We already were broken. Our arses were sore. Uh, you know, our legs were sore. Our hands were blistered. And that was after about five hours. We had, to, we, had to row, we had to row a thousand miles down the coast of Africa just to get to the point where all the other people that would row across the Atlantic, just, just to get to the point where they start from. Um, we rode through a two-week storm, and it was just, just horrendous. Probably it was up there, it was like some of the worst two weeks I've ever had in my life. It was we, unbelievable. Uh, we pretty much had uh, the Gore-Tex jackets on and trousers for the first two weeks, like Ross said. Um, and we had the, the boat builder who built the boat thought it would be a good idea to put foam pads in for beds and that was amazing for the first couple of nights and they started to get wet and then we realized that they didn't dry out we tried drying them out for five six days nothing happened so we got rid of them and we spent the next two months lying on a on the the hard fiberglass bottom with no padding and you kind of like lie on your side with a t-shirt on your hip bone and then maybe one on your knee bone to sort of protect you and, and that's pretty much it that's all we had to, to sleep on so the conditions during the row were, were absolutely horrible, without doubt, uh, some of the hardest stuff um, I think that both of us have, Definitely. have done. In fact, you can see it in this picture, there's, the boat was just horrendous. Everything was sharp or knobbly or, or just designed to hurt you. All those little bolts on the store, they would smack you in the head. You're just constantly getting bruised or cut or just smashed about on the boat. And then we hit this massive storm. Um, and the waves are coming in for basically for two weeks, but as high as this building. And they were, some of them were coming over as you get rogue waves. Um, and we had one that flipped us the first time we flipped. Um, cabin got filled. I was sat in the rear position, had my feet in the pegs. This is at night. And boat flipped over upside down. So I'm now upside, in the middle of the, upside down in the middle of the Atlantic um, with my feet trapped in the foot pegs. Um, the swell trying to take me out from underneath the boat and I couldn't get out. So I was trapped under there for about a minute. Luckily, I was able to hold my breath for that long. Managed to get my foot pegs out, swam out to the side of the boat, and grabbed on of it, um, looked around, and I just saw Ollie, who's, you might see a picture of him soon, he's a big lad. Um, he's about three or four feet away from me. He'd just gone into shock, and he, was just, he wasn't clipped onto the boat. So I managed to grab hold of him, 
getting back onto the boat, get back into the boat, we got the boat turned back over. But it's literally, if it had been sort of another two or three feet away from me, it would have been gone dead without a shadow of a doubt. So the, 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 the main challenge was, like Ross said, we're going to go from Portugal to uh, Venezuela. No one had ever done it before. Um, so we five thought, well, we could just do that. It'd be probably easy. Um, and it, it definitely wasn't, but we definitely thought it was going to be super easy and, and you know, we'd, we'd smash it. Uh, just a couple of random pictures. Uh, this is, you spend the whole time rowing across the Atlantic, getting bombarded by waves and bombarded by flying fish, which were getting <laughs> to about this size at some point, and they were, you know, they're pretty big old units. That was one of the best memories of that, was actually we were rowing across, and I was rowing behind Aldo at the time, and uh, I just saw out of the corner of my eye the biggest flying fish you've ever seen, it was at least a foot, and it was just gliding in, and I just thought, that's going to hit Aldo in the head, and it just kept coming in, kept coming in, and it just exploded on the side of his head, <laughs> and I just fish guts everywhere, it was just stinking for the next day. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a team at the halfway point, we're going to Briefly talk about the, the capsize, the first capsize, because it was pretty epic. But this is a team, so Matt, uh, myself, Foxy from the Channel 4 SAS programme, Ross and Ollie. And if you can notice on that picture, I'm, Ross and I are the smallest people on the boat. Uh, and those boats are not built for four big people, never mind five. And because we were doing the extra distance across, we then needed to bin all of our safety stuff, pretty much everything, so that we could get all the extra food in. Um, crammed into there. So this is, this is a team. I think the video is queued up to, to play now, just to intro the video. Uh, this is Foxy and I at about 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we had um, we'd just been capsized at night, or that night. Uh, we'll talk about it afterwards, but this is the video that we recorded uh, pretty much straight away. Hi, I'm Foxy, this is Aldo, we're Team Essence, we're part of it, and uh, over the last 24 hours, plus maybe a little bit more, we've had the best progress yet. We've been clipping five, maybe just over five knots every now and again, and we've done over 100 nautical miles. Great going. Cool, but as with all pride, uh, there comes a fall shortly after it. Um, six o'clock this morning, crew changed, totally caught off guard. Um, I was out on deck. Oliver was out on deck, Ross was on deck, and Matt was on deck. We got hit by a 20-foot wave beam on, um, which initially capsized the boat, which means it tilted the boat on its side and dragged it through the water. At this point, the four of us ended up in the water um, overboard. One of us basically didn't have a harness on at that point. We weren't clipped on um, just because it was changeover. Um, and then the next 20 foot wave that hit is rolled the boat completely upside down so the four of us were underneath the boat in the dark and the top of a <laughs> top of a massive swell for it seemed like a long time but uh, probably wasn't that long um, within a few minutes I managed to get back out uh, the boat was still on its side and then we climbed back on board and flipped it over completely in shock no idea what had happened and the force of it had ripped my trainers off and also all these trainers so we need to work out how we're going to roll for the next 2750 miles in bare feet which is not going to be fun and uh, while this was all going on Foxy yeah so I was in here in the comms cabin getting ready to go on shift as well Aldo had just left and uh, what I was doing was I literally as I opened the hatch again I didn't really know what happened. The force of the capsize and the roll pushed me into the back of the cabin and basically an immense amount of water came through. I dived forward whilst upside down, shut that, managed to close the hatch uh, and then looked out the hatch and it was black as in the, like, the black of underwaterness, which was nasty. And then we came up and uh, we started direct, like we all started directing ourselves and getting ourselves sorted. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it was proper interesting. Foxy's got a good way with words. Um, th that's what the boat looks like. And you can imagine that when you're rowing, you're, you're only sat sort of six to eight inches off the deck. And when you're rowing and we're going that way to Venezuela and we're sat looking up here, the waves that were coming in that night were coming up to where the roof is now. Um, so you can imagine we are a tiny little cork bobbing around and you can hear it through the night and we can hear it getting worse and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then obviously it gets dark and you can't see where they're coming from. And it is terrifying. If anyone here has rode across the Atlantic, they'll, they'll know the same thing. Um, 
that boat is the fiberglass is literally just four or five millimeters thick. So when a wave hits it, it feels it sounds like bloody bombs going off, and it sounds like the boat's coming to pieces all night. So so basically that capsize that we're talking about was the first one. It was pretty epic. All of us were scared. Uh, we were hypothermic. We didn't lose any kit apart from one poo bucket, which was fine. Uh, but the, the majority of us were, in fact, all of us were incredibly lucky. Ollie wasn't attached. If his fingers had come off of the, the safety line, he would be dead. He wouldn't be here. Um, without a doubt, it was one of the scariest things. So these waves come crashing over the top. And what actually happened was, is like it said there, we sort of got chucked down the face of this wave. And the boat starts to pick up speed. Everything shakes on the boat. And bear in mind, we can't see anything either. So you just basically hold on for dear life. And... Uh, what happened, the, the, the auto helm kicked in and just turned us side on into, the, into the, the wave, which then flipped us. Yeah, so then we ended up upside down. Like I said, it was pitch black. Obviously, in the middle, like, you can't see anything. You just instantly plunge into the freezing cold water, instantly going to shock because you know what's happened. And then it's our, when you actually get out and we would actually got back in and got the boat righted and managed to sort out all the kit, and then you actually realise what's just happened. Um, and the ocean is... a you realise how big and nasty that place is. It's, death is like, it's just a second away. But so many things where things went wrong in like a series of events, and if one more thing had gone wrong, someone had died, and that happened a good four or five times. It's really, yeah, it's quite, really so it wasn't as easy as we thought it was, and sitting in the pub having a few beers saying, let's roll across the Atlantic and make some records, it turned out to be quite difficult. This is a Foxy and I's little counter on the, uh, on the wall there, counting down the days. And uh, I mean, by there, you're living on the boat, you're living sort of minute by minute, never mind anything else, which I'll talk about later on. But it really does focus you into being mindful about where you are and what you're doing, because literally that is all that matters, is that square foot in front of you. Um, this is us at the end in uh, Trinidad. The, the end yeah. part was, was quite interesting. Yeah, we uh, obviously got all the way across um, the ocean. We came uh, down along the north coast of uh, Trinidad because we were going to hit the north uh, easternmost point of Venezuela, which is just a little land tip. Uh, and there's no sort of, uh, it's no urban areas or anything like that. It's just jungle that goes straight into the sea. Um, but then we found out that it's um, frequented by uh, drug runners and, and gun smugglers um, off the main area um, and pirates, um, which we obviously didn't realise when we were planning this. Um, the Coast Guard was supposed to come and escort us uh, along to, into Venezuela, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't come with us. So in the end, we decided to go in at night time. Um, and we went in really quietly, basically covertly, under it, a cover of fog in the end, which was quite lucky. Um, and when we actually got to Venezuela, it was visibility was like, it was pea soup. It was visibility down to about 10 metres. And we managed to navigate onto a beach that was no wider than about five metres in the end. So we managed to come all the way around the planet onto a five metre target and we hit it exactly in the middle. Um, managed to get off uh, the boats myself and Aldo were first off the boats, managed to drag the boat up onto the beach and we just fell over instantly. The legs just didn't work at all. So we just that, was, that was basically 50 days. Uh, there's a, a picture of the, the, there's a photo of the route that we took, the map, uh, which I'll show you later. Uh, but the route was 50 days, so we set uh, three new world records, um, well, two main ones, and that was the first team ever to roll from mainland Europe, or the first people ever to roll from, recorded anyway, from mainland Europe to mainland South America, and the second one was uh, something else, fairly spurious, probably the fastest crossing, and the longest crossing that's ever been done across the Atlantic. Longest. But all of it was, to be honest, a complete, uh, for us it was a complete cuff, it wasn't really planned. Uh, but it just shows you what you can do if you've got the mindset to, to crack on. The, the, the sort of toll it took on our bodies was quite, quite bad. This is me getting abscess lanced in my legs and my knees. We, had them, we, had, we basically, after a few days, had galloping crotch rot, and that lasted for the full almost two months. Yeah. Um, under your arms, rashes, infections. Uh, what else? Did you Every, have? I had two vertebrae, for just from sitting in a bad position, I had two vertebrae in the top of my neck pushed out, which took about another two months of osteopathy to get them back in. Um, people were just getting cysts and boils just where the body was just so run down. So all in all, it takes, it takes a big toll out of you, but we are record holders, world record holders. We've rode across an ocean, never to be done again. <laughs> Ever. And I thought, I thought my time in a boat was finished, and then I finished that and went straight on the job about a month later to um, 
Papua New Guinea to the first descent of a river, um, which I was not happy about. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that is basically it on the, oh, on the boat. Cheers, Ross. Um, as I say, you can find out more about the, the boat and the crossing on the Team Essence uh, website. I need, to, uh, I need to probably rattle through these time. Are we okay? Because we started a bit late. So um, this, I just got back from a job in the Congo. So I'm just going to briefly introduce the type of work that, that I do, and then I'll, I'll run you through some slides. So with the background in the military and some other technical skills, whether it's ropes or you know, diving or security or safety, then I would go away with film crews and we, and we basically look after them. We've got you know, all the guys that are in the Marines in here. We have a, a set of skills that at the time you don't think are fairly useful until you see five people in the film team trying to put up tents, cook their own food and, <laughs> and make a film. So this, I just got back from this job last week. This is near a Gongo volcano in, in the DRC, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, it's based near a town called Goma, which traditionally is one of the most dangerous places on the planet. Um, but it is it's stunningly beautiful. I was there with my younger brother, Struan, who's there. Uh, and we had the worst, most epic job in the world. We had to go down and collect a lava sample from inside it. Bear in mind, this is the biggest lava lake on Earth. And when we were in there, it was erupting. Um, so just to give you an idea about what we do, this is, this is a campsite. So we would, I would set up all the tents and technically get the crew inside the bottom um, and pretend I know what I'm doing inside an active volcano that's erupting and keep everyone calm. That's, that's an, a brand new vent inside the volcano which, which opened up. Uh, it's probably about 40 meters high, but this entire area along the bottom is, is brand new uh, lava runs from, from inside the from inside the crater, and the idea was, was that we were to get to where that orange cross is, throw some ropes over, abseil down, and then get a, a lava sample, which uh, didn't happen in the end because it erupted and, and the bottom of our ropes were basically melting, strewn. I was just in the point of abseiling over. On, uh, we filmed, I sometimes do on-camera stuff, and they were filming me going over the edge to, to sort of get this sample, and strewn was like, Aldo, you better not go over the edge, just wait two minutes. And then that whole cone that you're looking at, the whole side collapsed out of it and filled that entire area with, with um, lava. So I would have definitely been dead had it not been for Struan giving me the shout. So that's the sort of stuff that we do. Uh, keeps us busy. That's, us in the, that's me in the silver suit. Just uh, we We're getting lava samples from, from this new vent in, uh, in that volcano. So that's kind of, kind of what my day job is, is jumping between these bizarre jobs. Uh, and so I guess this Lessons from the Edge was more just sort of ideas that I've picked up along the way that I've found either helpful or that have, that have interested me along the way. This is out in uh, Venezuela. The, there was a, a film that we made for the BBC uh, last year, I think it was on, when we were rowing across the Atlantic, uh, where Steve Batshaw and I and a, a few other guys went to try and climb a, a tapui, which is the big sandstone cliffs in Venezuela, and then abseil down Angel Falls, which are the largest waterfalls in the world, and explore some caves, which all of it we did. And this, it, this is, of all the stuff that, that I'll probably run through that I've found out about, this is uh, out in Iraq, uh, is that we become what we think about. And that for me is, is that picture for me defines it, because since I was a kid, I wanted to be a sniper. I don't know why. Um, but in the Marines as well, and, and that's pretty much what that, that is and that depicts to me. So everything that I'm sort of thinking about all the time is pretty much dictate, dictating to me what I'm going to be doing in the future. Um, this is learning to skydive uh, a couple of years ago, but I, that, that's, I've always had this quandary about whether you should spend your money on stuff or on experiences, and from, from what I've found over the years is that all the stuff that I've bought is just tossed by the wayside and all the stuff that I've done experiential-wise has then become part of me. You know, going to Iraq, going to war, you know, going inside a volcano, skydiving, it all becomes the type of person that I am. Um, so I think that's quite an important one for me to, to remember. Is this fairly boring going through these? So I just go through them and... <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm almost bored of my own voice. That is the... So set big goals. That was the biggest goal, I think, uh, I've personally ever set myself or been set physically, mentally, apart from this last job. 
um, where, so we left Portugal, Lagos, and then we went all the way down. You see there's like a little wobble on it around about Cape Verde, and that's where we got smashed by that storm. And we ended up spending two or three capsized, well, capsized two or three times, and then we spent a couple of nights on <coughs> para anchor. We put a big parachute out the back, and it just holds you in the direction of the waves, and you just get battered for hours. Uh, so that's, that's the route. It's pretty impressive to see it like that. Um, and, but yeah, set big goals. I find that's always, always helped me, is to set huge goals, helps you achieve them. This is out in filming out in Yosemite. Uh, has anyone been to Yosemite? It's, it's beautiful, absolutely stunning, huge 1,000 meter granite cliffs. And the job there was to take a 13 year old climber up the 1,000 meters, which is about five or six days on the wall climbing, sleeping on portal ledges, and this was for the BBC. So that was us in the morning. The sun was just coming up, and we're just jumaring back up to start putting in the new, new part of the route. Um, but that belief is something that I, I took from that trip, is, is probably believe that most stuff, if not all stuff, is possible. You know, and there was a lot of people telling us there that, that you know, this wasn't possible to take a 13-year-old to, to go and climb such a big mountain, but we did. And she was the youngest person ever to do that, which was quite cool. This is uh, out in Norway. We did a, a program where we were basically rigging at 71 degrees north. We were rigging a lot of stunts for uh, a lot of celebrities. And this was one of the, the big ones. And it was one of the scariest ones to rig because even though the rope is fairly uh, thick, well, it's a 70 ton breaking load rope that's strung across a, a crevasse, which is about 300 meters deep, which then goes down into down to the sea. So it's operation certain death if you <laughs> get it wrong. Uh, and I had worked it out, done the maths, done all the rigging stuff, and, and then rigged it. And then when I was going out on it, just testing it, going out, I had all these, like, like it says, self-limiting sort of beliefs. I had all these things in my head telling me that I can't do it and that I'm going to die. And, all the rest of it, and, and basically what I learned from that was that that little voice in my head that was basically trying to protect me or stop me from doing what, what I was wanting to do wasn't actually that helpful in any way, shape, or form in what I was trying to do in, in sort of rigging this stunt. Um, so kill self-limiting beliefs on that one. This is when the volcano erupted near Agongo, this is uh, the new vent on the, the right-hand side, as you look at it, is, is a, an explosive new vent, and, and the volcanologists that we were working with there had absolutely no idea uh, what, why it was like that. And, and bear in mind that I'm looking after safety, and I've got a crew of six people down there, and it takes about four hours to get out of it. That's the fastest moving lava on Earth. It's faster, um, it, it's as fast as water. There's very low silica content in it. So there's absolutely no way that you can get out of the way of that lava once it starts to erupt. So um, our plan was to go down and, and take a lava sample from inside the lava lake until this started erupting. And then uh, that obviously would have killed us. So we then changed and then we, we went and collected some of the lava bombs that were landing around about the tents. But uh, that one is a very definite have a plan B. And some of the people that we were working with there when we were in the volcano didn't have a plan B. They just thought we'd get down there and, and film as you normally film and get in the volcano and get what you want, forgetting that it's an active live volcano. This is in Norway rigging some more of those stunts. That's a, a Larkin frame and you sort of lower it out and it's for rescue. And uh, so we'd taken it from the rescue sort of scene. We were using it for a stunt to, to so the celebrities would climb down on the, on the ladder, get to the bottom, get a flag, climb back up, and, um, and, and get in and get tea and cakes, basically. Uh, but on there is be courageous. I think you know, doing a lot of this stuff, it does, it does mean that you need to be courageous. You, know, you need to have a lot of courage and, um, you know, to be able to do it. But what I found, though, is that is that, that gives you the courage to, to be more, uh, what's, when, be more courageous with the smaller stuff. That's what I always struggled with. And I think doing stuff like this helps me on a daily basis, you know, being courageous. If that makes sense, probably didn't. Uh, determination is drive, is, is everything that, you know, that's, that's driven myself and Ross and 
dunks and the rest of the lads that are in the core. Um, it's one thing that, that we have an abundance in whatever we do. And if you're going to do something, do it at 110% at the fastest speed that you can. And mixing all that up with setting big goals and you know, achievement, we pretty much, you know, it's, it's a guaranteed recipe for, for success. Determination, we needed it every single day on that row. It was, uh, it was without doubt one of the most boring things I've ever done in my life, and one of the hardest, and one of the, the most painful. Uh, but when you're, you know, halfway across the Atlantic, you're, we had no rescue. We were weeks from anywhere if anything happened. Um, and more than likely, if something did happen, we would have, we would have died. But if you then get bogged down with those bad thoughts in your head, mid-Atlantic, bad stuff can happen. And it's determination and the drive that, that forced us through that because there were a hell of a lot of dark times on the row. <coughs> this is out in, uh, I was asked to go out and do a film in, in the Congo and it was a, a, in retrospect of, of Ebola, um, a sort of a history film. And I went out there to sort of, uh, to, well, we went out there to make this film. But when I was out there, we, we helped to rebuild a school and do some various other bits and pieces that we weren't actually there to do. And I guess that kind of made me think about being selfish and how, self, how easy it is to be selfish, you know, in this day and age and in this world and in this country that we live in. Um, and, you know, to go out there and to, to share your time, experience, money, I found very, very, uh, very helpful for me. And I guess unselfishness is what I took away from that, from that trip. Uh, this is testing, uh, so a lot of my stuff is, it's not stuntman, so, but you, you're testing stuff to make it see if it's safe. Half the time, I don't know if it's safe at all. Um, you know, you just got to use all your skills and experience, put it all together and then make up a kind of like, will they die, won't they die, uh, let's try it. <laughs> um, and that, that's pretty much what I'm doing here. I, we were making a film about uh, a lot of Jewish people that were chased into a cave in uh, Slovakia by the Germans. The Germans blew up the front of the cave and they, they survived in there for, for three years by sending the kids out um, through the holes up in the top where the Germans sort of blew the, the cave in and they were bringing food back. And so this was a sort of feature documentary film um, about being in there. And anyway, I, I had to go and clear a load of tunnels and rivers. So I'm jumping in the river and getting fired down, you know, only that amount of space for your head uh, to, to test whether it was safe enough for the actors and the contributors to then go down and do it. But having a good attitude on some of these jobs and all of them for me is, is, is key. Uh, and I think, you know, with a good attitude, pretty much everything that, that you put your mind to, that, you know, that you want to do, you'll achieve it. Even when you don't want to do it and even when the job is hard or difficult, having a good attitude about it then allows you to achieve so much more and be so much more happy about what you're doing, even if you don't want to do it. That's what I learned from drifting down a cave. I'm just going to see how many slides I've got left. Uh, is anyone bored yet? I'm racing through them as quick as I can. Okay. Uh, teamwork. So that's a tapui. It's a sandstone monolith, sort of big uh, mountain that comes out of the jungle or the Pampas in, in Venezuela, and the plan was Steve and I, Steve Backshot and I, and a couple of other climbers were going to go and see if we can put a route up this. It had never been climbed before, and we spent seven days on the, on the wall, and if anyone's seen the, the program that came out, you'll see it was, uh, it was pretty tough, and, you know, the camera guy was crying, Steve was, you know, we were all almost crying, actually, at one point, with the amount of rocks and things that were coming down. But we had a, a huge team there uh, to be able to push us on and to push us up. And what was, you know, I guess I learned from that and, and from lots of other jobs is that teamwork is absolutely vital um, in all of these jobs that I do anyway. Um, and, you know, we couldn't have got where we got on the wall without the rest of the team and everyone being able to help us. You know, what we did was, was epic. We, we spent days on a boat trying to get down river to get here, then days walking in, and then seven or eight days on the wall, climbing up, sleeping on the portal edges, which is like a camp bed that folds out from the wall, you dangle your feet over. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, I think teamwork on there is one of the most important ones that I've, that I've learned over the years of doing these expeditions for, for TV and, and working in the Marines. Ch 
cheerfulness, cheerfulness under adversity is, is one of the, you know, the commando spirit ethos that, that gets bred into us from, from a young age when you join the military. I am not cheerful there because that's a thousand, although it doesn't look that high, it's a thousand meters up on El Capitan uh, where we're climbing that route with the, with the 13 year old. And that's a portal edge where you sleep on it. it it's, uh, it's like a camp bed that just attaches to the wall with a little bit of string. And when you're like sleeping in it, at night it feels amazingly comfortable then it starts to get light in the morning and then you start to get scared because you know here just when you look over the edge is a thousand meter drop straight down you know into the the trees there so I should have put admin on there having good admin on the wall is is key uh you know you can see all the ropes and where all the climbing kit goes and where your poo bag goes you don't want to get your poo bag mixed up with your pee bottle or your food bag um so good admin maybe cheerfulness as well but I was Terrified on there for the whole time we were there, uh, just mainly because of the work we were doing and the, the load that we we're under. But cheerfulness in adversity, I still uh, look back on it and think I was definitely scared, but cheerful when I was on it. This is, I, I was in an accident a couple of years ago. I got wiped out um, by a, a snowboarder over in the Alps somewhere. Um, and broke pretty much everything in my left side. Thankfully, Ross was with me at that time, although he was just learning to ski and was doing a, a bomber's snowplow. It took him 40 minutes to get to the bottom to then raise the alarm to then get back up and <laughs> tell them that I'd been knocked out. Um, but I pretty much had been about a 20 foot hit into the air, skis off, broken all my ribs, broke everything on this side. Um, and it took sort of three or four months really to, to recover properly from it. Um, there are much worse injuries and, and things out there that, that happen to people um, and that are happening to people. But for myself, being fairly active, four months was, was a long time to be holed up in hospital and, and get myself sorted out. So I think from that one, I learned resilience, which, you know, the ability to get up after you've been knocked down mentally, physically, you know, verbally, whatever it is, the ability to get up and crack on regardless of, of what you, you know, of what you're feeling. And I think that's pretty important. It's probably also bred into us from, you know, being in the Marines as well. This is the same volcano near Gongo in the Congo. Uh, and that is six years ago. We did another film in there for the BBC. There's some places on the planet you should never go to once. And there's some places on the planet you definitely shouldn't go to twice. And this is one of them. Um, it's, it's without doubt one of the most dangerous, weird places uh, on the planet. Uh, this is, these two guys are a volcanologist and they're going down there and they're going to try and collect a lava sample from the top of the, from the top of the crater. That crater is 500 meters wide. It's absolutely massive. It's half a kilometer wide. Um, and they were going to collect a, a lava sample. But the main thing from that is, is that their radios packed in when they went down there, no batteries, no spare batteries. Um, and they cracked on and they went out to, to collect a lava sample. We were on the other end on the radio telling them when they could and couldn't go, but they'd already started to go. Um, and you can see that that big flow of lava that's, that's coming down there, that basically killed, almost killed, sorry, the, the guy who was collecting the lava sample. And that was a massive, what I learned from that mistake, you know, it's very unusual that mistakes in, in real normal life day to day would kill someone out here in that line of work and the line of work that we do, that's very true. But I think what we've learned from that is, you know, we all on that team made a, a big mistake that day, but they happen and they're perfectly normal, natural, um, and it helps, us, it helps us learn and move on from, uh, from making that mistake in the first place. And when we went back out, you know, just three weeks ago to do the same job. That was one thing in my head that I knew that I had to make sure it was nailed, was that comms were good, um, or communications were good on the radio when we were down inside the volcano doing the last section of it. Fear, uh, fear <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Angel Falls, um, which is the highest waterfall in the world. I'm lucky enough to have, to have abseiled off the top of it. I'm not lucky enough when you go to the top of it and you attach your ropes and then you walk back towards the edge of it and then it's a thousand meters straight down on a route that basically nobody's sort of checked or tested. Um, and that was for the Steve Backshaw uh, film. Absolutely amazing experience to be able to, to abseil down, you know, the highest waterfall in the world. But 
the fear. I still get the fear. I work at height all the time. I dive, you know, I do all these other things, but I, I get the fear a lot. And I get the fear before a job and I get it during a job. I get it when I'm lying in my tent at night and the volcano erupts and there's gas coming in through the, through the flap of the tent. I get the fear, but I think what I've learned on this job and, and several other jobs is that mainly, uh, from what I can tell, fear is an emotion and it's something that can then be checked, usually with a bit of rational thinking and a massive kick in the backside by myself, sort of verbally. But I find that fear is definitely one of those things that, that is manageable and, you know, translating it into normal everyday life you know, the fear that we actually feel a lot of the time isn't really fear about what we're about to do. You know, once you start breaking stuff down and working through it, you can, uh, you can usually try and dispel a lot of fear, usually by knowledge. This is out in uh, Africa. I was asked to go out during the, the, the Ebola outbreak, and uh, I went out for two and a half months to Sierra Leone, DRC, um, and Guinea, and... Uh, Liberia, I think it was in Africa, right in the middle of the, the Ebola outbreak, to make a feature doc about people dying of Ebola. And um, obviously, the first thing that any normal person would say is definitely not, uh, definitely not going. But it was one of those things, I guess, be bold. You know, once you actually get all the information and gather all the information in about something, it's very different to what speculation is. And nine times out of ten, speculation and people's opinion are the you know, the worst things that you can actually listen to. The chances of actually catching Ebola in a room with someone with Ebola are fairly small, unless you go and touch them and, and come into contact with the bodily fluid. So I thought that'd be brilliant and uh, to go out there and experience, be able to help document what was happening. And I ended up spending two months out there going into the ETUs, the Ebola treatment units, watching kids being burnt on piles, you know, watching hundreds of people being buried every single day. It was... Um, it was pretty harrowing uh, to, go and, to go and basically witness all of that. Um, but be bold. For me, be bold, you know, and go out there and do the job. And that's exactly what I did. And, you know, the experience was, was life-changing for me. Uh, and we managed to... The film will be coming out in cinemas this year, and it will raise a lot of awareness about Ebola, HIV, and uh, lots of other different um, emerging viruses. So I think... Be bold on that one, but do your homework. Take calculated risks. This is us in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. I'm just checking and see how many. I don't think there's that many left. Five or six slides. Uh, we, I drove across the world basically last year um, from London down to uh, Thailand with, with this Channel 4 documentary. I don't know if anyone saw it, but uh, the... It was basically a cluster from the start to the end, admin-wise, logistic-wise, as you can imagine, taking four student-type people and uh, a safety crew and put them in two cars and drive every single day for 15 hours until they get to Melbourne in Australia. Um, and that's exactly what we did. But the thing that I learned from this trip is ask questions. I assumed way too much on this, like the little hero car had a spare tire. Um, like the hero car had a, um, you know, we did do the checks and stuff, but all, all of the, the questions that I didn't ask let us down um, on the trip. This is us broken down. We were only broken down there for three days, so it was fine. <laughs> three days in the middle of the, the, you know, the step, the Kazakh step. So for me, ask questions. So I now always do, and I ask the stupid questions that no one else will ask, um, because I know that sometimes transferred into my line of work, that usually ends up in either being in a lot of pain because I've done something wrong or someone getting injured, which is uh, not cool. This is the only slide I had with something that relatively looked like communication. That's a phone. Um, this, is, uh, this is out in Reventador Volcano. We filmed out there last year doing a film for a Discovery Channel, and that's it erupting. It erupts a lot, and now we're again we're going out to collect a lava sample. I seem to be doing that a lot now. Um, but we had to go out and, and try and collect a lava sample from these, uh, from these huge um, clouds, as it, as it, or the projectiles. And the, the, the projectiles that were landing when we were going up and, and having a look for, you know, to try and find them in a, a spot to camp, um, the projectiles are about this size, and they've been blown a kilometre and a half out the top of the volcano to down to, to where we were camping. It's a pretty dangerous place to camp. Um, 
but yeah, on, on that trip for us, communication was key, radio, speaking, um, and I, I guess, you know, it's from all these jobs that we do, comms are the most important thing pretty much, and it's always comms that let us down because the production companies don't listen to us on what we say. Um, but for us, comms are, are, are super important. And, and translating back from that, you know, interpersonal skills and being able to talk to people and listen to people. Um, and I've also found out that I need to listen more when it comes to, to communication and talk less. Don't worry, there's only a few slides left. Uh, this is, so we were out in Venezuela and we uh, dropped into this cave system on a tapui, which no one had ever been into before. Um, so we're exploring sandstone caves, which are mind-blowingly beautiful inside. And most people think caves only, are only formed in, in limestone, but these caves that the scientists are now studying, uh, you know, put that, put that to, um, to bed. You know, these, these cliffs, these cliffs and tapuis and, and cave systems are absolutely out of this world amazing. And inside, we drop down and we spend sort of two or three days getting into the back of the, back of the cave. And then we pop out into this, uh, basically like a, a long crevasse. Without doubt, nobody had ever been there before. What we took into there, um, bacteria-wise or on our feet, clothing coming from the cave, everything will have been taken in there would have been new and from us. So I guess we would have, thinking about it, we would have changed that environment forever. You know, the first time, I've done three or four first things, first descents, first whatever, first climbs in, in the last year. And I'm always aware of that, that every time we go there, we're changing it, changing the environment, changing us. Um, but change is refreshing. That's what I was getting to the point of, for me anyway. That's what I learned there. That is, we did a, a driving job with uh, some celebrities, Tom Hardy and um, Mika Salo, Adrian Brody. And it was basically taking a load of celebrities, taking them out of their comfort zone, drive across the world on some dodgy roads, make a TV program about it. And that's pretty much what we did. That is our vehicle bogged down. It's been bogged down for two days. We've got no rescue crews. Um, we, we're basically stuck. Um, and we were stuck there for quite a long time. But the point is, is that as a crew, we kept making decisions. And I think that's from a survival point of view as well, from, from what we get taught when we are, you know, back in the day in the Marines, is keep making decisions. Even if you're in a situation where you're making wrong decisions, at least you're in control of the decisions that you're making, as opposed to being <coughs> sort of wafted around by the wind or the waves. Um, so keep making decisions is what I learned there. Mindfulness, that says, not mindful and. Um, this, this is, this is the, the biggest thing that I learned on the row is that, you know, I spend, I'm so hectic thinking about that job, that job, that job in the future, worrying about everything in the past, about what I've done and who I've upset. And um, being on the row teaches you very much to be mindful about right now, the present. And this is the only time that you've got dominion over. You know, you can't really affect anything in the future because it's not happened yet. And you can't change anything in the past. And the past doesn't really exist anyway. It's just a thing. So for me on the row, it was like the penny dropped, you know, that I need to be much more mindful about what I'm doing right now. The people I'm with right now are the most important people, you know, at that point. What I'm doing is important. Um, and I think that's, that's definitely the biggest lesson from the, from the row, even though there's no picture of a rowing boat on there. That's uh, Kaitura Falls out in Guyana, I think that is. I think it's the highest free fall waterfall in the world because Angel Falls sort of comes out in little dribs and drabs. Um, but that's about 400 meters high there. That is, I think that's the last slide. Um, jumping back to what we said at the very start, you know, it's, it's lessons that I've picked up and learned over the, over the years from doing these jobs um, and, and what I've found helpful. And this is the biggest one is that, you know, jumping back to it from the start is that we become what we think about. And that is an example there. There's five blokes there who'd never been in a rowing boat, never rowed, never, never even sailed, didn't even you know, know what the difference between an oar and a paddle was. Um, but that's five blokes there that got in a rowing boat with the right determination. And most of the lessons that I've talked about that I've learned over, over the years, we were sort of all channeled into to doing that row. And we proved it, that you can pretty much, anything is possible, but you've got to think about it first. And that is the end of the end of session. A 
I think we've pretty much finished on time. Hopefully didn't put anyone to sleep. Uh, right, I am totally going to climb up on top of the roof and get that ball down that far kicks up there. I'll probably abseil down as well. Um, okay, we're going to open it up to uh, questions now. We've got Claire and uh, Nicole with microphones, so if you could wait, if you stick your hand up, if you could wait till the microphone gets to you before you before you shout and answer. You. But also, also, if you don't want to talk, a lot of people don't like talking in public. You can use the um, the text service, and it'll come through to the guys uh, down at the front. Good. I used to work for IBM. Right. One of the um, phrases, if I can call it that, was coined by the Watson family who started it, was analyze, sorry, analyze the past, consider the present, and visualize the future. Would you say that is applicable to what you do? And if it is, and given that that was from a business organization, do you in fact spend any time or much time talking to business organizations to um, educate them, make them aware of some of the qualities that you've had to develop for the work you do? Yes. I forgot to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, very much so. Uh, I think what we, what we do and the work that I do, you know, you have to analyze everything, you know. What was it, analyze? Analyze the present. Analyze the past. Yeah. Consider the present and visualize the future. Well, that's exactly it. And, you know, a classic example is, you know, is rigging for the volcano, you know, and, and basically it's, it's an unknown quantity. You know, how do you get people inside a, an erupting volcano? So that's exactly, we, I, I basically used that, um, but I wouldn't have, yeah, I wouldn't have put it in those words myself, but... Um, and I think there's very much, you know, there's a very much what we do in the adventure world um, and the lessons that we learn from that, very transferable into business life and into any other sort of stuff. You know, the guys up the back, you know, all Marines, you know, most of the stuff they do on a daily basis, they could walk into a, any organization and, and turn them upside down, basically. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty much, you know, what we do, yeah. Any more questions? That's it. I think one of your last slides was keep making decisions. What was the final decision that got that car shifted? Uh, basically, <laughs> yeah, uh, basically we decided that we then had to walk out, um, which is exactly what we did, um, and then got over the period of the next week, got the, the car recovered. Uh, with, with that one, you know, it's, it's just an, a sort of an example slide, but very definitely with, with keep making decisions is, you know, it's. It's one of the things, you know, in the volcano, Stroon and I, you know, we sat there pulling our hair out thinking, we don't actually know what we're going to do here, but make a decision, right, we need to go and climb to the top and get this bit of kit and bring it back down, you know, instead of just being baffled by what's sort of knocking us around. But we walked. <laughs> Any others? Um, what would you plan to do in the future? Is there anything else that you still want to do or do challenge you have wise. to do? Yeah, challenges. Um, yeah, I guess I want to do Everest and do, do one of the poles would be something that I'd be interested in, just mainly for the fact of where they are and, and what they are. But uh, we, we, Team Essence, are, are still chatting about doing some, some other projects together, so they're kind of uh, under, under wraps at the minute. But we're, um, we're very definitely going to do something else, uh, you know, as a team. Um, but we'll keep everyone posted on that. <coughs> Cheers, Cliff. Anyone else? Yeah. Can't see because of these lights. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's, um, it's fascinating. Uh, you're talking about peak performance in lots of ways, no pun intended, it doesn't really seem to fit into a, what you might term, quote, normal job, 2.4 kids, white picket fence. And what's the implication of that in terms of to achieve at this sort of level? Does, does that just have to go? Is it, is it one thing or the other? I'm not, not trying to uh, probe too much in your no, personal no. life. but. Um, it it's very, with that type of, with the type of work I do, yes, um, it's, 
it was pretty much all consuming. I spend a lot of time out the country. Um, I don't have a normal life, never have done. And that's what happens when you join up, you know, with the Marines, they turn you into a weirdo, basically. <laughs> Um, and and it's, it's very difficult to then, even when you do come out, to then settle down and have, have the missus and the dog and the kids and, you know, just go down and work in wherever. Um, it, it's difficult and I think we all, all of us lot that sort of in the same cast are sort of um, have our own ways of dealing with it. You know, sometimes we just get on with it and, and do what, you know, what it is that we want to do for the best otherwise. But certainly for me, Doing this type of work, it has, has had a, a sort of big impact on my personal life. You know, I spend a lot of time away. Um, so even just friendships and relationships, you know, are quite easy to break down over, over years of doing it. Did that answer it? Anyone else? None? Oh, hello. Um, I was wondering what made you leave the Marines, or was it just the end of your service and how you compare life in the Marines to what you've done afterwards. Do you miss it? Do you miss being in the Marines? Yes, uh, I did 10 years in the Marines. Uh, so you can, you can choose between four and 22 if you want. Um, it's, it, for me, it was, I joined at 16, so it was, uh, you know, it was pretty much my whole entire life. It shaped everything up till now, even though I've been outside as long as I was inside. Uh, and in the Marines, it's, it's pretty much shaped my entire life, the way that I am, the way that I act, the way that I stand, the way that I walk, the way that I talk to people, the way that I, you know, do all these things has probably been a lot of it from you guys, you know, be able to, to back me up. But it, it seems to have quite a large impact on you, um, and a lot of it subconsciously as well. And it's all the smaller stuff, like the way that you conduct yourself, you know, the commando ethos of courage, determination, unselfishness, all these things that we take super for granted, you know, aren't, aren't sort of things that lots of other people are, have bestowed on them or, or, you know, have been sort of bound. So um, I think it has massively, that has massively affected the way that I am now and what I do now. Um, and certainly the type of work, I wouldn't be able to do it had I not been in the Marines anyway. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of sort of, he was in the Marines, he must be good at this job and it's some job that I've never done before and, you know, have no idea about, like driving a boat or... But there's a lot of assumed greatness that goes with it. And I think for me, in this line of work, that helps me for sure. Anyone else? The, the kind of work you're doing just now seems to be touching maybe on the celebrity side of things, but then there's also stuff that may be more kind of factually based scientific exploration. And you mentioned like the, the Ebola documentary. Do you have a preference between the two? Would you see you going down one route or is it just a case of the jobs that, that arise? Um, the, there's very much definitely sort of the stuff that I work in. There's two, there's entertainment and then there's, there's sort of science. Um, and the, the science stuff that I've done so far, I mean, I'm not, obviously I joined the Marines at 16. I can barely tie my shoelaces and count to 10. So, uh, you know, so a lot of the science is lost on me, but I, I pr much prefer the, the factual stuff because it's real. A lot of the other stuff in television can be constructed reality or, or slightly fake or, you know, and it, 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 for me, it's much better to work on something like the Nat Geo one we just did in, in the volcano there. It's, you know, it's super exciting, it's interesting, it's fun, um, and it's real and you know sometimes like the Ebola one you're making a huge difference you know you're, you're getting a lot of information out there you're risking your life with stuff but you're getting information out there um, which normally wouldn't wouldn't see the light of day so yeah factual probably Thank you very much. Uh, I think from now on I'll be recommending that you are the guy that you need on every shoot. Um, you talked about how you manage fear and how you, you change is refreshing about being, having really good admin so you've got the right kit that you need at the right time in the right order. How do you cope when um, you're working with celebrities and they start to panic, get broken down, get the fear, don't want to carry on? Um, a lot of that has to do with the type of person you are and, and being able to, um, being, a, being, a, being a nice person when the proverbial hits the fan is it always, always makes a, a big difference. And that, that's probably something that again comes from, a lot of this stuff comes from being in the military where you, you know, you've got so much stuff going on um, that, you know, that's potentially very dangerous that you need to keep very, very calm, collected, 
and go through processes. And that's kind of that's kind of how I conduct myself anyway, especially with you know celebrities. You know, like out in Norway, we've got ten big celebrities, and we're sort of throwing them off abseils or death slides, or they're swimming under the ice. Um, and it very much comes down to, to being calm and collected. And I think that that sort of, uh, that sort of goes across into to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. And not showing that I'm absolutely panicked myself. Good evening, and thank you very much for your contribution. It was very welcome tonight. I'm thinking here about being an effective individual in our global contexts. And I was wondering, thinking about the importance of communications in modern living languages, would you have any suggestions to a young person wanting to be an effective individual about which particular modern language or languages, in addition to our own, that it would be good to make a good stab at? So basically, what language would be the best one for them to, a young person to learn? Yeah, to and effective. make an effective contribution I, in the world. I, <laughs> A lot of the places that we go to or that I've been to in, say, Africa or South America, you know, so for me it's Spanish and, and French have been useful, super useful, and, you know, especially in Africa. Uh, so for me, both of them are really, really interesting. I haven't spent a huge amount of time over in, in the Far East, so I can't really sort of, you know, comment about that. But for me, definitely Spanish or, or for traveling, Spanish and French are standard and they work. Did that, did that answer it? All right. Anyone else? You can shout if you want. If you... Uh, do you think the, the drive and determination to do these sorts of um, extreme activities comes more from who you are and an inbuilt characteristic, or is it something that you learn and get an appetite for as you've grown up and as you've done more of them? I think for me it's uh, very definitely uh, in my character trait um, and probably in our family. My twin brother he's in, was in the Marines as well up until recently. So uh, we, you know, we've probably had that inbuilt sort of gene that wants adventure and excitement. But there's very much a lot to, uh, a, a lot to do with going and doing the thing, going and having adventures then leads on to the next one. It gives you confidence. All of these things give you confidence that you can then achieve something else afterwards. And so I think for me, it's probably a bit, a bit of both. You know, it's, it's very definitely in there. You know, I was climbing when I was a young kid. Um, and then to, to want to join the Marines at a young age, you know, that also says you're kind of adventurous. But I think, you know, the Marines also then teach you a lot of that stuff and you get that probably bug, that need for a little bit of excitement. Hello. Uh, you've travelled the world and seen some amazing places, but you were brought up in Scotland, which is an amazing country. What would be your favourite spot to go adventuring in Scotland? Glencoe, without a shadow of a doubt. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> I spent, my twin and I used to get the train, uh, the train up to Fort William and buses and stuff to go up to Glencoe from a, a young age. I spent, I spent years going up there. You know, the climbing's amazing, the walking's amazing, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's actually one of my most favourite places in the world, Glencoe. Not co-winning where I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think that's it. If there's no more questions. Thank you very much for coming. I'm sorry if I bored anyone, but thank you very much. That was, uh, that was wicked. Cheers. <laughs> and Ross as well. <laughs> that's it, Ben. Um... Just before we go off, and I'd like all of you to join us, to join Aldo and Ross for some drinks and some uh, canopies. Um, I've been, actually, <laughs> I've been sitting here with my stomach churning because of that slide that's been up, and here it is straight in my face. It's been, it's been, an, it's been an overwhelming, actually, experience listening to you, and particularly those lessons you've learned from your adventures. You know, many of them, I think, you know, as, as a leader in an organization, I recognize, you know, setting big goals. But I've learned a lot about as the thing that is sticking with me is cheerfulness in adversity. What a wonderful, what a wonderful thing to have learned and what, what an amazing attribute for people to have and so important. So, um, 
But I think what's come over for me tonight about all the attributes you've described, the things you've learned, is a tremendous uh, humility and authenticity. They're the two uh, features that I have taken away from, from your, what you have shared with us tonight. And I really want on all your behalf, and, and, and Duncan's gone, thank you so much, Duncan, for introducing us to Aldo and Ross. Thank you for sharing, for being here with us tonight, and for letting us in, in, into your experiences. And, uh, and I know each of us will have taken away something, something quite unique and special from the evening. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.